Okay, it looks like it's about 8.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us this morning, everyone. Uh, have another fantastic HVAC-related webinar for us, for you this morning, part of our SECO-sponsored HVAC webinar series. Um, if, if, my name's Jason Vandiver. I'm Energy Code Program Manager for SPEAR. You can see my contact information there at the bottom. If you have any questions or anything comes up afterwards, happy to help. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping about how the webinar works. Uh, we will hold all questions till the end. Uh, you can type in your question. You can go ahead and type in questions as we go into the Q and A uh, panel on your toolbar there, and and we'll answer the questions at the end. Um, for those of you that want ICC CEUs for this morning's webinar, uh, Mariel will send out a course evaluation form. And if you fill out the course evaluation, then she will send you the ICC CEUs for the webinar. Uh, this is the fourth that Alex has done for us. Um, the other ones are available if you go to YouTube and just uh, search for SPEAR, or the third, I guess. You, if you search SPEAR Communications, S-P-E-E-R, Communications, uh, all of our Speakers Bureau webinars and uh, SECO HVAC webinars are up on the YouTube channel, uh, free to watch at your at your leisure. Of course, you don't have the the luxury of having the the knowledgeable presenter to answer any questions. Uh, but if you do watch some of the previous ones, uh, feel free to reach out to me if I can't answer it. Um, or Alex's contact information is also at the end of those webinars. Uh, he'd be happy to help you as well, I'm sure. Um, just so you know, next Friday is kind of a part two. I'll let Alex kind of elaborate on what's coming up next Friday, which is failure is inevitable, how to fail on paper instead of in the field, manual D design. So that'll be next Friday at 8.30 as well. Um, those of you that have been following the work we've done with the Texas Energy Code Field Study, uh, the whole second round of data collection is back, and Richard Morgan will be doing our regularly scheduled Wednesday Speakers Bureau webinar this coming Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning on the field study analysis. Uh, I do have a couple more HVAC live training scheduled, uh, June 4th in Lubbock. Uh, I've, I've had one person register so far for Lubbock. I'm not sure what's going because we advertised Lubbock and El Paso at the same time, and I already have 82 people registered for the El Paso one. Uh, so the, any of you folks on out in West Texas, uh, please pass around the, uh, the word that that's going on. And with that, I think I've covered everything. And if you want to share your screen, Alex, we'll go ahead and turn it over to the expert and let you get started. All right, let's see, screen two, share. That should do it. Looks good. All righty. And cool. All right, guys. <clears throat> so welcome to my little session here. Uh, residential duct design is backwards. Uh, I'm Alex Meany. I'm the senior trainer for RightSec. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> MyTech RightSoft. That's a new one, right, Tech. Uh, MyTech RightSoft. Um, I uh, travel around the country uh, teaching people how to use our software. Um, uh, which also includes how to design residential HVAC systems uh, because that's what the software does. Uh, I'm EPIC certified, which means I'm certified to teach manual J, manual D, manual S, and all that other fun stuff. Uh, and so this is mostly about manual D. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that most people in attendance, uh, when they uh, think about sizing a duct system, think about uh, taking a duculator uh, or duct slide rule if you prefer, um, and uh, finding a number on it and uh, figuring out how much uh, air a certain size duct holds. And well, that's not the way you do that. Um, it could be the way you do it if we uh, were doing commercial work or had more options, but it's not how you do that. Uh, and so I'm gonna uh, take you through why, um, hit a few high points and sort of, well, assume you don't know what you don't know. So, um, I'm going to take you through some of the, the real fundamentals of uh, airflow, um, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, <clears throat> little little teaser to start with, um, you know, you showed up, so you probably know that air sizing duct systems is important, uh, but I do occasionally encounter an attitude of like, you know, it's not that big a deal, it's a seven versus an eight. 
Um, and so I do like to show this. This is actually, I've, I've, I've built this in this presentation, but I show something like this. Um, and it's, you know, this is how people think duck work, right here, this bottom line. They go, it goes from five to six to seven to eight to nine to 10. I mean, but when you think of the area inside that duck, this is how duck size increases, right? And so you're not actually talking about a difference between a seven and eight, you're talking about the difference between 39 and 50, which is a much bigger difference when you, when you look at it, right? It's a, it's a 25% jump, uh, not a, not, you know, one seventh, whatever that would be, uh, jump. So <clears throat> this is important. Like I said, you're here, you know, it's important. That's why we're doing this. So um, <clears throat> whenever we talk about uh, duck work, whenever we talk about airflow, uh, the word pressure rears its ugly head everywhere, right? Which is pressure this, pressure that. And um, you eventually start to come to the uh, idea, come to the conclusion, like pressure is a bad guy, right? Pressure is the enemy. Uh, we don't want pressure. Pressure is bad, right? Static pressure, that's, that's a bad thing. Well, in a, in a very generic, uh, generic uh, you know, physics sort of way, uh, pressure is, is the one doing all the work, actually. Pressure is not the enemy. Uh, pressure is the one that's, that's pushing airflow. Uh, your fan creates pressure, right? It's air moves um, from high pressure to low pressure, right? Delta P. Um, and so pressure is the one doing all the work here. Um, when you have trouble with airflow, uh, the enemy the, the enemy is friction, right? Friction is the thing that pushes back when you're trying to push air through a duct, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, so we kind of need to like dissect this and, and get a better understanding of, of like, well, what the hell is pressure then, right? So pressure is essentially just another way of saying energy, right? Um, when you're talking about uh, the, the pressure of the system um, or the pressure the fan creates, you're talking about how much energy uh, the fan is imparting to the air, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, you think about like a cue ball hits the eight ball, there's a transfer of energy. Well, the fan blade spins, there's a transfer of energy there, right? Um, and the energy that the, the air has, that's the pressure, right? So pressure is another way of saying energy, and you have to use that energy, right? Um, when the cue ball hits the eight ball, the eight ball does not have the option to just sit there, right? Once you transfer that energy, once that cue ball hits, strikes the eight ball, that eight ball has to go flying off in a direction, right? You have to use the energy that you, that you impart, right? So <clears throat> when the fan split, uh, spins and the air now has energy, the air has to do something with it, right? Um, and so there's two ways that you can, you can move energy uh, or use energy. There's two ways we do use energy. And it's to, to, number one is the intended purpose, which is to move the air forward. And the, other, and the second one is, is when the energy deflects outward, right? And so if you aren't able to use the energy that you have to move forward, if the air isn't able to use the energy it has to move forward, it's going to use that energy to deflect outward, right? Those are the two ways you have to use energy. Um, and so we, we have names for those, right? There's velocity pressure, right? So it's the two kinds of pressure. There's velocity pressure, and that's the energy that we use to move forward, right? That's pretty simple. Um, and then there's static pressure, right? And so when the air is not able to move forward, uh, that air has to do something with the energy, right? It might not actually move anywhere, but that energy is used somehow and it's used to deflect outward, right? So <clears throat> when we look at it in a duct, right? Your velocity pressure is the energy that you use to go this way. And your static pressure is the energy that gets used pushing against the, the walls of, a, of the duct itself. When I do a, a, an in-person presentation, I usually just cut open a water bottle, right? And you know, when you blow down the water bottle, that's the velocity pressure, and I'll take my fingers and just pull against the sides, and that that pushing against the sides of the of the of the of the surface of the duct, that's static pressure, right? And <clears throat> engineers will sometimes say pressure is always equal, right? Because the, <laughs> you know, engineers and physicists, man, they will turn anything into a formula, right? There's a formula. It's total pressure equals velocity pressure and static pressure which is just it's something you can say in English, man. Like all of the pressure is made is one of these two. All of your pressure, all of your energy is going to do one of these two things, right? And pressure is always equal. Yeah. Okay. 
So people will take that sentence and they will think it means weird things. So I like to say pressure is always in balance, right? It's a little bit of a, I have fewer people getting confused by that, right? So if you are gonna use your energy to go this way, well, you're not gonna use much of your energy to do this, okay? Um, if not a lot of energy gets used to do this, well then a lot of energy gets used to do that, okay? Um, that's actually, that's why you measure static pressure. You're indirectly measuring velocity pressure, right? We don't actually care. I mean, we're obsessed with static pressure, right? Um, that static pressure is all we talk about, static, static, static. Um, <clears throat> but our job isn't to create static pressure, right? Um, and our, our, we're not afraid of the consequences of static pressure until you get to like fan motor stalling amounts of static, right? Um, you know, you know who worries about static pressure? Hydraulic engineers worry about static pressure because, you know, if they get static pressure wrong, things explode. I've yet to see a duct system explode, um, although I've heard rumors. Um, <clears throat> the reason we measure static pressure is simply that velocity pressure is a pain in the butt to measure, right? If you measure velocity pressure, you put your little tube into the airstream and you take a measurement, the problem is um, it's hard to get that tube exactly perpendicular to the airstream. Um, and so the, the measurement tends to fluctuate qu quite a bit, right? It's hard to take a reading. And air is turbulent, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to take that measurement. And because air is turbulent, the air could be moving a little bit differently here than it moves here, than it moves there, than it moves there. So you have to take a bunch of readings, average them together, and it's, it's just a pain. Well, if we know these things are always in balance, and I can take a measurement of static pressure, which is a lot easier to measure because, you know, if you picture, you know, if I, if I took a, again, I'll go with a bottle of water. It's one sitting next to me on the counter. I think that's probably why. If I, took a, if I took a bottle of water, if I took the water and I poured it on the floor, when the water hits the floor, that water spreads out. When the air is pushing against the surface of the duct, that energy is spread out by the surface of the duct making a static pressure measurement a lot more even and easy to measure, right? And so if I can do the thing that's easier, measure static, and I will know something about the thing I really wanna know, well, that's probably a good way to go. So if static is high, velocity must be low. If static is low, velocity must be high because you have to use your energy. If you're using it for this, you're not using it for that. If you're not using it for this, you must be using it for that. That's why we measure static. If you wanna get an idea of how pressure is always in balance, this is, uh, this is dumb. I know it's dumb and look, looks dumb, but this is a great way to understand how pressure and static are in balance, right? That little fold there that runs up the little wiggly man here, the, the air dancer is, that, that's the official name of these things, by the way. I had to learn that to look this stupid thing up. So <clears throat> that little fold there goes away the second air has somewhere to go, right? When that folds over, air doesn't have anywhere to go. And so static pressure builds up and starts pushing the thing straight up. And as soon as it starts getting straight up and down, the second that thing gets straight up and down, air has somewhere to go. And as the velocity, so now it's going somewhere and the velocity goes up, static pressure goes down, it falls over or starts to fall over. And immediately as it starts to fold over, it creates a crease, air has nowhere to go, static pressure starts to build again and it starts to build up again and the cycle repeats. That's how static pressure and velocity pressure are always in place. And yes, I know that's a little silly and I do apologize, but you know, we'll get rid of that, okay. So static pressure, velocity pressure, they're just two parts of the same force, right? We want velocity, we don't want static, we're trying to get velocity to happen, and the reason velocity doesn't happen, the reason air doesn't move the way we want is friction, right? And so friction is the thing we should be worried about, right? We want nice, smooth surfaces here so there's not much friction, right? Like our, our, our metal duct is gonna allow more airflow than a flex duct if we don't size them you know, differently. Um, and you've got lots of friction in here, right? And even more friction in, this is not a very aerodynamic fitting. This is, a, unless you put turning vanes in it, this is a bad way to go. This would be a better way to go. 
Um, and actually, more friction is created in these in these fittings than in uh, the, the the duct itself. Um, watch out for how many turns you put in there. Um, but if we need to, you know, like defeat the enemy here, if we need to create better airflow, we just need to reduce our friction, right? So we need to be able to measure friction, and that's a problem because um, friction's kind of hard to measure. Um, there's no such thing as a frictionometer. No, they don't sell that device. We don't have one. Um, uh, pretty much the only thing that's easy to measure um, in, in terms of a duct system, right? Even airflow is hard to measure. You, know, like you can get a flow hood and you can measure it at the, but like determining airflow in the duct is even tricky to measure. So our, our, our easiest thing to measure is, is static pressure, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, when it comes to uh, measuring static pressure, um, you've probably, and many of you probably know this, but we use inches of water column to measure static pressure. And uh, I had a previous version of this presentation, and I used these to show static pressure, which is my little science class manometer drawing. And everybody asked me why was there a plumbing P trap in my duct system. Uh, but that's actually literally as air, if this is tapped into the duct, air will push water. I guess that actually should be a little lower. Uh, air will push water down and then up the column, and the harder it's pushing, the further up the column it's gonna go. And so it's inches of water column. Of course, uh, we don't even use this one anymore. We now all just use digital ones, but I couldn't find a clip art drawing of a digital manometer, so this is gonna have to do. We're, we're switching to this one. So we can measure static pressure, great. We know how to do that. If people, most of you probably have done that. If you're uh, not an HVAC professional, but somewhere adjacent in the, in the industry, that's something we do, and it's uh, easier to do than pretty much any other way of checking things about airflow. Um, so, Stay with me here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna break down how measuring static pre static pressure can be an actually a measurement of friction. Okay, so first uh, we have a duct, and we're gonna pretend right as physicists often do that things are perfect. We're gonna pretend there are no leaks in this duct. Okay, and so if I have a hundred cfm coming out of this end, then I'm gonna have a hundred cfm going in this end. Right. Um, now, some of you might be like, well, air is compressible, and if you're being that nerdy, you know, let's, let's just pretend, all right? We're not, we're not going to talk about that level. Um, <clears throat> so if I have air that slows down because of this fitting and this fitting and the surface of the duct, if it slows down at this end, it's going to slow down the air behind it, right? It's like a traffic jam, right? If air isn't moving fast over here, eventually it's not going to be moving fast over here, and by eventually, I mean pretty much instantly. Right? So if there's 100 CFM coming out, there's 100 CFM going in. It doesn't matter what kind of fittings are in here. Right? If I put more fittings in here, this number wouldn't be 100. But this number is going to have to match this number. Of course it does. Right? This isn't rocket science. Okay, fine. So that means that the velocity stays the same. Right? Same airflow, same size duct. Duct has not changed size going through here. Same airflow, same size duct. Same velocity pressure. Velocity is the energy I use to go that way, and it's going that way the same speed here and here. So velocity pressure isn't changing, but we know that there's friction happening here. So I should be losing energy. Why aren't I? Why, why is the velocity not changing from here to here? And the answer is because it's all static, right? We know we lost energy, we know we're not losing velocity, therefore, all of the energy, all of this friction is reflected in the loss of static pressure, which is how you measure friction. The enemy, it's how you quantify the enemy, it's how you identify the enemy, it's how you figure out why air isn't moving when you want it to, right? Friction can be measured by pressure loss. Right, so static pressure loss is a way of saying friction. Right, unfortunately, people often abbreviate it to static pressure. Right, well, sometimes we're talking about static pressure and we're talking about the external static pressure of a fan. Well, now we're talking about power. Now we're talking about how much friction or how much resistance can that fan handle. Bigger numbers are better there, right? Whereas bigger numbers are bad here, more friction is bad. So understanding what it is you're talking about when you use the terms, it's really important, right? So <clears throat> on to our, uh, uh, our actual duct design, right? So that's why we use this thing. And a lot of people are well aware of this, right? That a friction rate tells me 
how much pressure is lost across a hundred across a hundred feet of duct, right? Um, and that across a hundred feet of duct is a thing that you know we all kind of know about, and some of us have different ideas as to what that means. Right? Some people think that it means that if, as long as I don't go over 100 feet of duct, I should be okay. <laughs> um, that's definitely not what that means. Um, <clears throat> but it can tell me, it can quantify that. Um, remember, there were two kinds of friction, right? You have the friction across the surface, and then you have the friction going through the elbows and the T's and the Y's and the boxes and whatever else you got, right? So a friction rate can predict how much pressure, how much, excuse me, how much friction, I did it myself, eh? um, how much friction is created um, if you move your air across 100 feet of duct and the air is a certain amount of air and the duct is a certain size duct. So if I knew those three variables, I would know how much, how much friction there was, right? So when you're using 0.08 on the ductulator, you're saying that if I ran this duct in a, uh, for 100 feet in a straight line, right, if I hooked up uh, and, and it, it had exactly this much air through it and exactly this size duct, if I hooked a manometer at the beginning of that 100 foot run, and then I hooked up a manometer at the end of that 100 foot run, I would see a drop in pressure of 0.08 inches. That's what that means. Just in, in a isolated set of conditions, 100 straight feet of duct, this much air going through it, this size, 0.08 friction rate means the pressure will drop 0.08 inches in that 100 foot run, right? So it's a little hard to imagine how that takes me to how I'm supposed to size the ducts, right? Um, and so we just sort of trust that, well, you know, there's some method to, I've been doing it this way for 30 years, there's gotta be some method to this madness. Well, <clears throat> starting with the ductulator is what a lot of us get taught to do, right? We get taught to start with 0.08 or 0 0.10 or whatever the number is. And that is the proper process for commercial design. Because with commercial design, you say, this is how big I'm gonna make my ducts. And then you use that ductulator, you use that, you use that slide rule to quantify how much friction that creates. And then when you figure out all the friction in the system, you pick a fan or a motor or adjust your pulleys or do whatever you have to do. With residential duct design, and the reason why when people do manual D, it feels just confusing and weird and icky and just backwards, because it is from what they taught you the first time, if what they taught you was start with the ductulator. You see, actually, you're supposed to start with the fan because you know what? You don't have that many fan options when it comes to residential, right? Especially when you bring those pesky customers into the mix and their darn budgets. Um, <clears throat> the fan might be the fan. And so you're going to need to work out what size duct makes that fan work rather than what size fan makes that duct work. It's got to be one of them, right? And when you're doing residential work, uh, pressure is harder to manage because our starting pressure numbers are pretty low and the pressure loss, right? The friction numbers can be pretty high. So, <clears throat> This would be your commercial duct design process, right? For those of us who are big fans of starting with the ductulator, like I like 0.1, this is what I do. I use 0.1 on the ductulator. Cool. So here's the world in which you're allowed to do that, or here's the world in which it makes sense to do that, right? I'm not telling you what you're allowed to do, although we do know you're supposed to be doing manual D. Um, <clears throat> first, you calculate friction from the duct. Well, how do you do that? Well, you actually measure the length of a run from the longest, from the furthest return, out through the furthest supply. And you tell me literally how many feet of duct is that? And if you know how many, how many inches of water column worth of pressure loss, AKA how much friction is created in 100 feet, well, if you had 120 feet, you could figure that out, right? It would be 0.1 for the first 100 feet and 0.02 for the next 20. That would be a total friction of 0.12. And so how does that help you? Well, it doesn't unless you do a bunch of other stuff too. Because in commercial design, then what you would do is you would figure out what the coil pressure loss was, right? Uh, because there's a chart for that and you'd look it up. And then you'd figure out what the filter pressure loss was or filters, depending on how you have it configured, right? You only have to figure out one path, but you still have to figure that out. 
and then your grills, there'll be a little pressure loss there. And this is the kind of thing in commercial you might ignore just because the, the numbers you're working with are big enough. But um, in residential, you definitely can't ignore that. That's, you know, a good 10% of what we have available. Uh, and dampers, if you have any, and the fittings are a big one. But in residential, because all of the other variables, since you know what duct you're using going in, you can just figure out how much pressure there is, how much pressure loss there is going through a fitting, how much friction is created going through a fitting. So you get all these friction numbers. You figure out how much resistance is in this system you designed. You just add them up. You come up with a number. Like, all right, I've designed a system. This is the one I want. And it is that simple. You just design the system you want. But then you figure out how much friction that creates. And then you fi figure out what fan you're going to need to overcome that much resistance. If only it worked that way in residential. Unfortunately, in residential, we have uh, nominal tonnages and uh, uh, non-interchangeable motors. You know, at most, you have a couple of fan speeds. And frankly, you know, the idea of using low fan speeds is pretty silly these days um, with the very little airflow that they tend to give you. Um, you have uh, EER points to worry about, SEER points to worry about, and those pesky homeowner budgets. So in residential duct design, you go backwards. You say, look, this is what my fan can handle. That number right there, that is the, like, the speed limit. That is the best I'm going to be able to do. That is a high-end variable speed fan right there, that 0.7. So you figure out what you got, right? Now, if this is what the fan can handle and other things cause friction, not just ductwork, not just fittings, then you need to figure out how much friction this fan is going to have to deal with from dampers and grills and filters and coils. And when you figure that out, you'll have an available static pressure, right? If you take 0.7, you subtract all these things, you end up with 0.2, okay? So that 0.2 is what's left over for sizing my ductwork. Well, ductwork and fittings. So <clears throat> fittings are um, measured in something called equivalent length, which is a fairly easy number to wrap your head around. You don't really need to know it, but um, if you use, uh, if you use 0.08 as the nominal uh, friction rate, which is what manual D does, if you had a fitting that caused 0.08 inches of pressure loss, right? Remember the, remember the, the static pressure test, right? You test the static pressure on one side, test the static pressure on the other side. How much did it go down between point A and point B? That's how much friction it creates, right? So if you had a fitting, which would have 0.08 inches of pressure loss, by the way, that'd be a terrible fitting. Right, that's worse than that 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 hard elbow I was showing you. Um, but there are some that are, that are out there that are that bad. Um, if you had 0.08 inches of pressure loss in a fitting, it'd be the equivalent of 100 feet of duct at 0.08. And so uh, instead of calling that uh, fitting 0.08 inches of pressure loss, we call it a 100 foot fitting. If your fitting was 0.04 inches of pressure loss under nominal conditions, we call it a 50 foot fitting. If it's 0.02 inches of pressure loss, we call it a 25 foot fitting, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, this is something that our program will measure for you is the equivalent length of fittings. So that's why I'm not really getting into it. It just figures it out. And the actual length of duct is a pretty easy concept to understand. You add these two numbers up and you get 310 feet of duct. Not really, but when you figure the equivalent length of fittings, 310 feet of duct. And using this little calculator here and a little formula that you don't need to know, right? There's software out there that'll help you figure this out. You can figure out what the duct size needs to be. And this isn't 0.08, and this isn't 0.1. This is 0.06, which is actually the low end of the range. That is, that's as big as I'm allowed to make my ducts in manual D, right? But if I make ducts smaller, I'm gonna create more pressure than that. And that's all my fan can handle. And so you go backwards and you land on the number of the duct size that's going to make it work because you have to adjust something. And in the case of this, it's going to be duct design, uh, the duct size. So <clears throat> people have a problem with using 0.06 on the ductulator because it just feels wrong. It seems wrong. It's, it's not the way we've been doing it for so long, right? 0.1 and 0.08 have been the way that we've done it for forever, right? And uh, the problem with this is, is, is 0.1 and 0.08 used to work, right? And so 
telling somebody that you should calculate these sizes and we should put in these bigger ducts, it just it just doesn't doesn't seem right, right? And you, 80 CFM out of a six inch run, like no, that's a five, man. What the that that should be a or depending on what where they use flex or sheet metal, let's let's not let's not split that hair. But older systems, um, they I I feel older systems used to have a little more sort of wiggle room involved, um, and I feel that way about kind of all systems. I don't care if it's the systems in your of your HVAC system or system of your HVAC system or the systems that make your car go. Um, what used to allow for a little bit of wiggle room, you don't have anymore, right? There's a lot of things that used to work, right? You used to be able to fix a belt, right, on a car with a pair of stockings, right? And it wouldn't go very far, but it would get you home or it would get you to the mechanic, right? You used to be able to oversize uh, uh, an old R22 system and underduct it. When you did those two things, you, it wasn't working right, but it was working. And so we had this idea of all these years of this worked, and nobody really looked too closely as maybe why it worked. And if you want a little more about that, um, we, have a, we have a previous video, it's up on YouTube, um, about how there's no such thing as changing out like for like. And in it, we discussed how it's very possible how a homeowner could have a working three-ton system that you come in and replace with a new three-ton system. And that new three-ton system doesn't work because the three-ton system was always oversized and the new system is still oversized, but the wiggle room is gone because newer systems are more finely tuned and require a little more attention to detail. And you can't just get away with slapping a, pair of pantyhose around the belt, tying it nice and tight and limping it to the mechanic. You, you can't just get away with 0.1 and 0.1 of the duculator anymore. You shouldn't try, right? So <clears throat> sometimes it still works a little, sort of, you know, for the wrong reasons, right? This is, the, this is the thing we were just talking about. What would happen if the house should have a two and a half ton system and we put a three in it? But then we put ductwork that was way too small. Well, Right. Jason and I were just talking about this. He was walking our house the other day, right? Duck system looked leaky, looked undersized, but at least the system looked oversized, <laughs> right? That's not a win <laughs> for anybody, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's, that's not the right way to do it. But from the homeowner's perspective, they're probably not going to notice, right? Um, and by the way, if you're thinking about the cost of these slightly larger ducts, it, you can actually offset it by the cost of a properly sized system, right? So it's not, it's not so bad. It's not like, you know, oh, the bill's gonna go up. No, no the bill's gonna go up and then it's gonna go down, right? We're gonna use these slightly bigger ducts, but we're gonna use a significantly smaller HVAC system, right? So <clears throat> this, is, this, is, uh, this is used to be where I started this conversation, right? If I have somebody who's really a non-believer and I figured, hey, you guys show up to this, you're not non-believers. But um, maybe, you're, maybe you're good design curious and not convinced, right? This is one of the ways I look at how there's just no way, <laughs> like no way what we used to do still works, right? If we've been using 0.1 and 0.08 of the duculator for 30 damn years, right? And this is what a two-ton house used to look like. And this is what a two-ton house looks like now. You literally just have to go further. Like, and we know longer runs are gonna cause less air to come out, right? So if you don't change something, we should be losing airflow, right? When we go from a small house to a big house with the same fan, we should probably be getting less air out of it, right? Not to mention this new house has got some big open floor plan concept where I have to go over the river and through the woods to get my duck from one end to the other. Whereas this one was just straight shot flat attic. So this is my terrible drawing of a coil. I tried to find pictures of coils that I could show you that would show you the difference between old ones and new ones. And well, none of them looked right when I made them small. So I made a pretend one, right? But the spaces in between, there used to be more room for air to get through. New coils are more restrictive, right? And even if you're using a fan coil, that's still being cooked into the design of the unit. Right? Units that used to be able to handle 0.5 inches of static can now handle 0.4 inches of static. The things get 
more or are getting more restrictive, right? This filter here in the old house, yeah, this used to be able to used to be there to keep the cat out of the furnace, right? And now we've got filters that stop microns of particles, right? And we know that the newer filters cause less air to, to be able to get through them, right? We know it gets in the way of airflow, right? And so if we know that well, less air comes through this than comes through that, and we don't change anything, what do we expect? We, ex we should be expecting less airflow if we don't change. And then there's the fan location, which depending on where you're, where you're located, you might not have seen a lot of changes in this, but a fan located in the middle of the house, right? In a, like an upflow in a closet or even a horizontal unit with the attic access is in the hall and we put it up there. Um, one of the things we'll talk about next week is resistance adds in series, not in parallel, right? And I know that's a, that's a lesson from your electrical class, right? Well, actually it's a lesson in anything. Resistance adds in series, not in parallel. The same works for water, the same works for air, right? If I'm cutting my distance in half, if I have a duct that goes this way and a duct that goes that way, or if I have a duct that goes out here and over there, all of this adds up. Only one of these does, right? And so by moving that, that, that location, we've increased restriction on the fan. We've reduced airflow. And by the way, reducing airflow should not be an option for us. So we need to do something, right? It's like, well, no, well, they've made fan power better over the years, right? Fans are better than they've, no, they're not. Like, they're definitely not. So <clears throat> um, a big thing for me is not using rules of thumb, right? Um, sometimes when people put me on the spot, I will say there's only one rule of thumb that I will use. Uh, look it up. <laughs> and some people take that to mean like, oh, look up the rule of thumb. That's weird. That's a weird thing. No, the one rule of thumb is look it up, right? And uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit too next week. So I apologize. There's a lot of overlap between learning how duct design works in the big picture and actually doing one. But the thing that you can't not avoid learning is that there's not a whole lot of consistency in the HVAC industry, and we pretend like there is. We pretend like, hey, 0.08 should work. You know, look, it said, look, I dialed it in, 0.08. It says this much air comes out. That should work, right? Look at this. I, mean, I don't know if you know what you're looking at here, but let's talk about it. This is one brand, by the way, of equipment from the same family, okay? So I'm, we're not looking, I didn't, I didn't compare a, a, a Goodman two-ton to a Carrier five-ton to a variable speed this to an ECM that to it. Uh. This is one brand, one family, right? And so if I have a two ton, and just understand that if you wanted to use 350 CFM per ton and not 400 CFM per ton, that's fine. But you're still going to be, so you'll be a little higher on the range, but the range will still exist, right? So I'm gonna use 400 per ton because I think it's just still easiest for everybody to do in our heads. It doesn't matter what you use, right? So I, I was taught that, you know, medium high speed 0.5 is nominal airflow for every, for every piece of equipment out there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that was a long time ago. Uh, and then I learned that that is utter BS, right? Because this two ton unit at 0.5 inches of static is 800 CFM. Hey, I was right. My rule of thumb was right. See, goes to show you, Alex. 0.4, I can get 0.7 or 0.8 inches of static between 0.7 and 0.8 inches of static. See, look at that, 0.5, all the way. That's what you do for, for, for fans. Yeah, except when you go to the three ton. And if you use speed tap three, you get 1200 CFM at 0.2. This, for nominal airflow, is less than half the power of this at speed tap three. Okay, well, we have to use speed tab four on that one, and that'll get us to 0.5. Yep, it will. But did you know that? Right? Or we're using a rule of thumb. Right? Oh, and by the way, when you go to five ton, if you actually wanted 2,000 CFM of air, good luck, by the way. Um, 0.4 inches of static. Right? There goes my 0.5 theory. Right? Now, granted, 0.5 is pretty close, but still, this... You can see the pattern, right? As fan size increases, fan power is decreasing a little bit compared to 
the previous size, right? Is anybody using different friction rates for different tonnages? No, of course not. That's nobody does that. You don't have to do that. Nobody ever told me I have to do that, right? But man, if the thing pushing the air is less powerful, less air is going to come out unless you do something, right? And pressure loss on coils is all over the map as well. So the nice thing is, if you if you're doing fan coils, right? The coils in there, it's cooked in, um, and so. Uh, you probably don't have as much to worry about. Although, is the coil rated dry? Is the coil rated wet? This is a thing we'll talk about next week. Um, there are some factors to, to consider. Uh, but when you're using for furnace coil combinations, which, you know, lots of Dallas does, parts of Houston, I mean, it's a bit, pretty big thing in Texas. Um, <clears throat> you look here, look at some of these numbers, right? First of all, the size of the coil matter. If you use the smallest one that fits nice and neat on the smallest cabinet, that's great. Small does not mean aerodynamic though. So if I wanted to put 800 CFM through my two ton, it's one and a half to two ton, but that two ton cased up, up, up low coil, that's a 0.23 inch pressure loss, right? Because 0.5 is where the thing starts, right? I'm gonna lose half of it to that, to that coil. But if I use the largest two ton, then it's 0.08, right? Which is less than half, it's actually about a third. Right, a little less than a little more than a third of the pressure loss. That means it gets two thirds more air through it. Right, there's less restriction coming through there. Actually, that's not what it means. Two thirds more restriction going through it. Um, and so it has a bigger impact on reducing airflow. If you don't adjust for that, you're just getting different airflows at random. Right, and if you look at four and five tons, oh my god. Right, like if you think point two three is bad, how about point five? Look at how nutso this is, right? If we talked about this fan being able to handle 0.4 inches of static at 2000 CFM, if for some reason I wanted to use this coil for 500 C for 2000 CFM for five tons, it creates more resistance than the fan can handle. That's without duct, right? I put this sucker in the middle of the room. And by the way, even if I use the largest five ton, Right, the largest five ton cased up low coil has 0.4 inches of static pressure loss on it. Right, why do they, like why bother? Right, it's not getting the airflow, like just getting through the coil, just getting through the coil is gonna create this much pressure loss. You start adding ducts, you start adding filters, you start adding fittings, this might be the amount of airflow you're getting out of a system, right? Um, one of the trainers for the ACCA has the saying, five-ton systems don't work. I don't think that's necessarily true, but five-ton systems are harder to make work for, for certain, right? By the way, the reason, there's a few reasons for this, but one of the biggest reasons for this is, guys, um, the velocity, right? Think of the orifice on a two-ton blower. Now think of the or orifice on a four-ton blower. Um, you don't double the size, right? And so air is coming out faster because if they kept the size of everything proportional, no one would buy the five ton unit because they couldn't fit it in the house. And so they have to be practical about how they, they make things, you know, how big they make things. Otherwise people just won't, won't buy them. Um, and so more they become more resistant and that becomes a problem for obvious reasons. And I literally, I sat down to try to do this for filters and just gave up. <laughs> Uh, a lot of filters don't even have pressure loss data, which is what I would call a major red flag, right? Um, <clears throat> a lot of filters will say, oh, our pressure drop is 0.1. Yeah, and you read the fine print and it's 0.1 at um, uh, 200 feet per minute, right? 200 feet per minute doesn't happen at a cabinet. Like that is not, maybe at a, at a filter phase, maybe. Right, or excuse me, a return phase, maybe, right? But point, so point one is a, is a bogus number. It's a, it's a, it's a scammy number, right? And then you get, you're confusing it. Like I got to read this chart and try to figure out like that's kind of confusing. Um, although not so bad, actually, if you guys recognize the chart, this is one of the better ones. Um, plus, I mean, how many different, different options are there for filters, right? So the ranges on a filter could be 0.05 inches of pressure loss all the way up to over 0.4, right? And when you consider that plus a coil, if you're doing some of these high, like a five ton unit, like, I mean, how, like on paper, 
I can't even, I can't, I can't get it to work. I can't get any of the air out of the mechanical room, much less through the duct system. So uh, hopefully this whole time um, you were thinking, yeah, I knew all that already, dude. Like, what, why am I wasting my time sitting here? Hopefully, I'd, hopefully you don't feel like this is a waste of time. But if you know all this and you're not adjusting your duct size, like what are we doing? Right? Because a duct isn't, it's not a glass of water. It's not a, it's not a beaker, right? It doesn't hold a fixed volume. There's a hole on both ends, right? You know that. I'm not telling you anything new there. I know you know that. We, we all know that. Anybody knows that, right? But when you use the ductulator and say, this is how much duct and air holds, you're talking like this. And you know it looks like this. That duct will hold however much air you can get through it based on the power of the fan and the friction created, right? And you know, this is my favorite way to talk about filters, right? Filters stop small particles. Air is a small particle, <laughs> right? It's going to impede airflow too. Um, and we all talk about the homeowner going to Home Depot and buying their own filter and I got a service call because they froze the coil because stupid one inch Merv rated ultra filters get, you know, 0.4 inches of static loss on it. I'd, I'd recommend you look some of your filter pressure drops up because even those four and five inch media filters, right, the good ones have pressure losses in the 0.2 range, like starting point and, and go up from there. Um, and then, you know, you know this one too, right? If your ductwork has to go up and over, around and through, versus going in a straight line, you know, you, you get more air out of a smoother duct by like sheet metal and, and, and out of straighter runs. But we end up making these concessions to builders and their buildings and the shape that they're in because it's hard to get air from one end to the other. And so we have to go around and this and that and the other. And so we know less air comes out unless we do something about it. Right. And so that's what manual D is, right? It's a way of keeping your fan power and what it can handle, right? And the duct in balance, right? When there are lots of things making it hard for this to move air, you got to make this bigger to balance it out, right? If you have a very powerful fan and you don't have a lot of stuff in the way, you don't have, you're using a throwaway filter and you're using, you know, a very restricted or a very low restriction coil, or you're using um, uh, a fan coil with a rated wet, and all, you know, it's just a more powerful unit. Well, you can make your duct smaller, but it's going to stay in balance. By the way, these are laws of physics. If you don't adjust this, the way it's going to stay in balance, less air comes out, which you knew, right? And so the way you do a duct design in residential is backwards from what they taught you because you can't start with the ductulator. You have too many fixed things in the system. You have to design around them, right? You pick a duct size to make all the rest of this work, right? But otherwise, you're going to have to size your duct system and then start picking five-ton blowers to move three tons of air, which you're not going to get an AHRI match for that. That's not, it's not an option. And let's not talk about the noise that would create, right? So let's see, I, I only see one question. So I'd like to throw a real quick demo before I uh, throw my contact information up. And so it's, it's more of a, just a um, proof of concept of how residential duct design works. So here is an actual design duct system in, in RightSoft, right? You, we laid it out, right? A nice round sheet metal system here. It gives me all the sizes. And these sizes are about what you would expect for this airflow from, from sheet metal duct, right? They'd be bigger if they were flexed, but um, this is, this, these, are, these are correct sizes for this application. I know because I did the math, right? But <clears throat> this is with an air handler unit with a small wet coil adjustment instead of a, an aftermarket coil. And it's with a low restriction filter. Right? And that's where I end up at point one of the ductulator. So don't worry too much about what all this is and the math is. It's not, it's not important. This is all output anyway. You don't do this math. The program does. This right here. This is why duct design is backwards. And this is actually, this is why some people try using our software and be like, it's broken. It's not working. <laughs> like you don't, the ducts are too big, right? Well, because if this is a furnace and I've got a point two inch pressure drop, First of all, this isn't going to work. This is a bad system. It's, it, it failed. Ducks are too big. 
we can go back here and find that. Okay, these are all sevens. That's an eight. This is 18 inch duct. By the way, this is a thousand CFM system. It's an 18 inch duct, right? Um, you know, 18, like it's just everything gets crazy sized, right? So, so that's not going to be able to work. I'm not going to be able to make that. I'm not going to be able to make that happen, right? Well, what if I had a higher speed tap that I could go to, right? Well, if I go to a higher speed tap, well, that's still a seven. That's still a seven, right? This is a 16 here. You know what? Let me do something here. There's a, a type of design that I'm doing that looks weird to people. So we'll just make them all sevens. So that's a seven, that's a 16, but like these are in the, this is 0.08 on the duculator, right? Um, <clears throat> whereas if I didn't have that coil to contend with, it could be sixes, right? And that's, that's what duct design, that's what residential duct design looks like, right? You start by saying, look, this is what my fan can handle. This is the stuff that is going to be in the way. What should my duct sizes be? You land on the duct sizes, not the other way around, right? Um, of course, if you want to do it the other way around, you could keep playing around with this stuff until it gave you a number you liked. But can you actually do this? Do you have the equipment for this? Do you have the materials for this? That becomes, that becomes the question. Right. Um, so there's two questions. There ought to be enough time for that. Um, why don't uh, Why don't we start? Yeah, doing and, that? and, and I had a couple more come in through uh, on an email as well. And then I have one lady that raised her hand. So oh, let okay. me go. Let's see if I can unmute her and allow her to talk. Jennifer Selman, I'm going to allow you to talk if you'd still like to ask your question. I'll, I'll come to you first. So I'm clicking the button to allow you to talk. Jennifer, you have a question? Okay, I'll come back to you, Jennifer, but just FYI, I will unmute you again if, if you'd like. Um, the couple that I had come in directly to me was do you have a preference at that big filter at the air handler versus a filter at each return? So, I mean, there's pros and cons, right? So filter at each return in a high ceilings can be real pain in the butt to change, right? Get practical about it. But you tend to have, if you just want to talk airflow, you tend to have lower velocities moving through, you, you should really have lower velocities moving through the return phase than you would at the cabinet, right? Um, but you could, achieve, you could achieve the same thing with doing two, um, a two-sided return in, uh, you know, the bottom line is lower the velocity going through the filter and it's better for airflow. So the return filters tend to have lower velocities. All things being equal, they should be better for airflow. Right, because that's the big factor. Squeezing more air into it causes it to be more restrictive. So, can can you lower the amount of velocity, the amount of airflow you're pushing through that same size space? That makes sense, and it seems like the the big one right at the air handler would increase your static as well, wouldn't it? It can't. Well, yeah, it increased. Yes, I mean, it increased. Remember, static pressure is going to be generated by friction, right? And it's going to create more friction. There'll be more pressure loss across it. Well, that's all things being equal though, right? I mean, the number of pleats per inch in the filter will affect it, right? Different kinds of media will affect it. And so <laughs> I'm, I may end up answering a lot of questions this way, but the rule of thumb is look it up, yeah. right? There's a chart for it. Find out what the pressure loss is. And, and by the way, people, look at, people hear that and like, oh, it's such a pain in the butt though. Guys, learn what you're paying for, man. Why, like, you, you know how many premium, like, high, you know, high-end filters that are, you know, these are better than the ones at Home Depot, you know, that turn out to be just as restrictive as the ones at Home Depot when you look them up? Like, look it up, and you'll be like, oh, I shouldn't be buying this. They're, they're scamming me. It's worth it. Trust me. Okay. Besides economics, why is duct work size decreased in size as you tap off the trunk line? Static is the same. Velocity happens at size <laughs> of tap. <laughs> um, so, uh, I think I know who, an who asked this question, um, but, um, the, it, the answer gets a little complicated, 
but um, essentially, uh, <clears throat> the if you if you have a a single pressure vessel going this way, right? There's going to be significantly more pressure at this end than there is going to be at this end, which shouldn't actually be a problem if you balance everything, right? Um, it will be a little temperamental in balancing it though, because the pressure tends to build from the end of the pressure vessel. Um, reducers have a tendency um, to, not tendency, they do um, raise that pressure up a bit uh, as, you, as you move through, giving you a more consistent pressure in the trunk, making it easier to work with and easier to balance. That's a, it's a bit of a nerdy one, but um, that's, that's sort of the short answer to that question. If you, if you wanna get more in the weeds, we probably better do that online. I don't wanna to get too, too weird. Okay. All right, uh, this is a comment. Some AH, some air handling units, furnace manufacturer data may include ESP includes a certain amount for a default filter. Yes. And adjustment for electric heat strip, hello carrier. And yep. typically there's SP for a dry and wet evaporator coil. Yep. What, what yeah, now? So we're going to talk about that one next week. But Okay, that's next week. Um, uh, long story short, um, there's a lot of inconsistencies in um, how this stuff works. So uh, if we go back to our, say, our coil pressure drop, right? What I didn't talk about and what I – see, this is the wet – and this is the dry, right? So you do have to know what number to look up. We kind of we kind of sped read the numbers that we're looking up. Next week we'll do a little bit more of an active design, and there's a section in it that that, that tells us we always got to read the notes because one manufacturer will, will rate their air handlers with a dry coil, another manufacturer will rate their air handlers with a wet coil, another manufacturer will rate their units with no filter, another manufacturer will rate their units with with a filter. Some manufacturers will rate some of their air handlers with a, some of the furnaces with a filter, some of their furnaces without a filter. Oh, well, that's, that, that um, keeps it simple. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I, I know I said that really fast. It was to illustrate how inconsistent it is. And the conclusion, the, the rational conclusion to that is, gee, I better look it up. Because different many and by the way all those manufacturers you know and one of the reasons they do this is so that the numbers look comparable to their competition when they put a dog out there they rate it with a dry coil and no and no filter right <laughs> and, oh it's 0.5 but you compare it to the other guys who's rating with a wet coil and with a filter you're not comparing apples to apples anymore okay and then there's one more and then i got a quick one just to my own I don't think we really have this in our cooling dominated climate in Texas, but I got a question. Are trunk and branch designs superior to radial duct designs? Um, there's a pro and a con in my opinion, right? The, the trunk and branch system, because it is a single pressure vessel is so much easier to balance. Mm -hmm. um, radial designs are an, a Royal, like, if a radial design isn't done really well, it becomes really hard to fix. Whereas a trunk and branch system, a lot of times just a couple of tweaks of a balance damper can take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the, the radial designs, depending on how they're done and depending on how well they're installed. And that's the other thing, like a lot of the, a lot of the answer to that question becomes about the practical and not the math. But if you want to talk math, um, some radial systems can have, because of the resistance adds up in series, not in parallel issue. Some mm -hmm. of those, some of those things can have, um, lower resistances overall. Um, but then they get the flex duct running, you know, wrapping around a freaking whatever. And like the box still in the middle of it or whatever that negates that right out of the bat. So, so it's a little, right. it's a bit, of, it's a bit of an academic distinction. Um, but for practical purposes, um, you know, trunk and branch systems can be, have, have some distinct advantages. But in, in mathematical, for mathematical purposes, radial systems are not, they're not the devil. All right, on, well, we are right on time at 9.30. Uh, yep. And that's, that's answered all the, the attendees questions. So we can go ahead and cut it. And really looking forward to the elaboration next Friday and getting into some design. Uh, so looking forward to having all you all back next Friday. Uh, and you guys have a 
fantastic weekend. Thanks so much, Alex. It was really great. Um, appreciate you. Appreciate you joining us. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody.